This is Changing Your World with Creflo and Taffy Dollar, bringing you the Word of God with simplicity and understanding. Now listen to the Word of God and watch it change your life. So the question that most people have concerning hell, number one, is hell real? Number two, is hell a real place? Number three, do we create our own hell? You've heard people say that. Well, I don't believe in a literal hell. I believe that I'm going through hell right now. You, ain't, you don't even know how wrong you are. Now, my objective tonight, please understand that people don't fear God like they used to. And because we lack the fear of the Lord, then we're very casual with things that we do. And because people don't fear God like they used to, they feel that there are no consequences for rejecting Christ. And we create all of these weird religions and we go around and we hear people saying that there's more than one way to God and, and we buy all this stuff and we give more attention to singers and movie stars than we do to God as if they're not going to die one day. They have more faith in man's ability to solve problems of life than they do in God's ability. It's called humanism. And humanism is a classical learning. It's a philosophical system of learning. It wants to crown man as the solution to every situation. It wants to say, you know what? If we get together, we can be our own God and we can make our own way. It's deceived many into thinking that there is no heaven. It's deceived many into thinking that there is no hell. It's deceived many into thinking that there is no God. It's deceived many into thinking that there is no Satan. The greatest thing that Satan has been able to pull off is to deceive you and others that he doesn't exist. It's deceived many were consequences for wickedness and living life as a sinner. Well, let's get in the word. Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Now, as we begin this tonight, some of you are going to be tempted to run out of here and say, I can't handle this. Please let me explain something to you. You can run all night long, but you're never going to escape the reality of what I'm getting ready to share with you. See, you shouldn't be afraid of what you can see in this life, but you ought to be afraid of the one that can, can be responsible for destroying your soul in hell. So don't allow a, a fear to come over you tonight that says, ooh, I can't deal with that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. Hear it now or hear it later. But it would be better for you to hear it now so you can make sure you don't have to hear it later. Are you listening to me? Now, Mark 7, 13. Let's read verse 13 out loud together. Ready? Read. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. What's happening in our society is that our traditions have made God's word of no effect. We trust and we believe in our traditions more than we believe in the word of God. For example, most of us can remember when we were in our churches that we grew up in, they had something called church dues. And then we opened the Bible and found out about tithing. And for years, there's been this big fight <laughs> because our tradition has made the word of no effect. So I'm asking you to forget about the tradition and to focus in on the word. The tradition about hell. The tradition about, about heaven. Whatever that tradition is, let it go tonight. And I want you to focus in on what the word has to say. Now, 
Matthew chapter 10, I need to share this with you, and I'm just laying our foundation before we start. Matthew chapter 10. My objective tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to show you how much God loves you. That he loves you so much he sent Jesus to save you so you don't have to go to hell. <laughs> because God knows we all deserve it. Every last one of us. The only reason that we'll miss out on hell is because we made Jesus the Lord of our lives. Other than that, the Bible says, the only thing you got to do to be a sinner is to be born. Because we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 says this. Let's read it out loud together. Ready? Read. And when he was come into the house, I am in the wrong chapter. Verse 28, let's try it again. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body. Where? Now, tradition says that this is, uh, you know, hell is just some, some type of emotional type of state. But this is a real place. So listen to me very carefully. By understanding the reality of hell, you will begin to clearly see and understand the great sacrifice and love demonstrated on the cross by Jesus for us. When you can understand and, and get a hold of the reality of hell, you will, you will love Jesus. You will, you will see how much God loved us to send his son to die for us and Jesus went to hell for us so we don't have to go to hell. So why go to hell when he went to hell for you? Why, why, why dismiss that and end up going yourself? Now let's look, look, at, look at Acts chapter 2. Let me show you this. I have to show you everything I say tonight. The book of Acts chapter 2. You see, a lot of people joined the church, but they failed to become a part of the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Let's read 24 out loud together. Ready? Read. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. He's referring to Jesus. That Jesus, most theologians don't even believe that Jesus went to hell, but you read here that he suffered the pains of death. The Amplified says, but God raised him up, liberating him from the pains of death, seeing that it was not possible for him to continue to be controlled or retained by these pains. And then in verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left where? Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heavens, but he saith unto himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So Jesus went to hell so that you and I don't have to. He went in our place, and if we accept him as our Lord and as our Savior, then we will never have to see or experience the torments of hell. Please understand something, ladies and gentlemen. Because of the sin of Adam, every man that was born after that point was a sinner. Because of the sin of Adam, everybody, the Bible says we were born into sin, shaped into iniquity, which meant that we all qualified to go to hell Jesus showed up and championed over sin over death over the grave and over hell which means he took on our sin 
and he made us righteous. Which means he took on the death we should have died and died in our place. Which means he went all the way to hell and suffered the pains of hell for you so you don't have to go. So I dare some talk show host to get up on television and tell you there's got to be more than one way to the Father. There's got to be more than one way to get to heaven. There's only one way in, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the way to the Father. No man can get to the Father except they go through Jesus. You cannot get to the Father through Mohammed because Mohammed wasn't perfect. Mohammed sinned. You cannot get to the Father through Buddha because Buddha wasn't perfect. Buddha sinned. But the only man, the only man, hallelujah, the only one to ever walk the earth that never committed sin was our Lord and Savior, champion of the world, Jesus. So understand what happened. Jesus now cut a deal with the Father. He said, I know they all messed up, but how about this? How about let them come in on my ticket? I never sinned. So if they'll get in me, then you will see them in me and not see them and see their sin, but you'll, when you look at them, you'll see me and you'll see my righteousness on them. And as long as they accept me as their Lord, hallelujah, then you're not looking at what they used to do. You're not looking at what they used to be. All you can see is who they are in me. So if you subtract Jesus from the equation, we are, we, are, we are destined to hell. But if you get in Jesus, no demon in hell can touch you. Hell has no right to you. When you get in Jesus, heaven has to open its gate because they don't see you. They don't see me. They see us in him. And in him we move. And in him we breathe. And in him we have our very being. So without him, you're nothing. And don't let this world fool you that, that how do you know your religion's right? We don't have religion. We got Jesus. Are you listening to me? So let's begin. Who was hell prepared for? Who was hell prepared for? Hell is a real place but we need to find out what did, what, who, why did, why was it prepared in the first place? Let's look at scriptures. Matthew 25, 41. First question we're asking, who was hell prepared for? Matthew 25, now I just told you that great news about Jesus. So what you're about to experience, you never have to experience its reality. All you got to do is take advantage of what I just explained to you. Matthew 25, verse 41. Let's read verse 41 out loud together. Ready, read. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil. Prepare for who? So there is a devil. And there is something called everlasting fire. What's that? That's fire that can't be put out. So here it says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. What does it mean, his angels? When Satan deceived a third of the angels and they decided to follow him in rebellion against God and God kicked them out of heaven, all of those who were involved in the rebellion, he said, there's got to be punishment for this. You were never meant to be earthbound. You were angels. You were sons of God. You were meant to be heavenly bound. But now that you insist on doing this and you insist on being earthbound, I'm going to put you below it. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Now you got to understand that this world 
influenced by evil spirits will tell you that hell is not a real place. And a lot of people bought it. Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the, the north. Notice how many times you see I. Wherever you see I, you see the spirit of Satan. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to where? To the sides of the pit. You will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So according to these scriptures, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, Satan is destined to hell. Well, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And when you get to 2 Peter chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 4. I mean, you're about to see some amazing things. You're about to hear some amazing things. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. Let's read verse 4 out loud together. Ready, read. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down where? And delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So notice what it tells us about hell. He, again, we see that the, it was prepared for the devil and his angels. We see that Satan is destined to, to reside in hell. We see that these angels that sinned against God are going to be held in jail where they're going to be chains in captivity. Now, go to Isaiah chapter 5. And verse 14, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14. How many of you believe the word of God is true? Verse 14, I noticed the first part of the scripture, and here's what he said. Therefore, hell has enlarged herself and open her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend going down descend into it so hell was enlarged now my question was and i'll talk to you about it in a moment how did hell become enlarged and why was it enlarged we started off seeing the first very primary fundamental purpose for hell it was created for the devil and his angels that rebelled in heaven against God to use to incarcerate the spirits of those angels and Satan but now watch this the book of Psalms chapter 9 the book of Psalms chapter 9 Verse 17, notice who else is now going to go to hell. Now, notice why he enlarged it. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Let's read 17 out loud together, ready, read. The wicked shall be turned into, and all nations that... All right, so, so now notice it sounds to me that the wicked men and those who forget God are now also going to be in hell, so they enlarged it. Now, what happened here? Let's go to an actual story that Jesus told. Luke chapter 16. I want you to pay very close attention to this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is biblical evidence that hell exists and it is a reality. In Luke chapter 16, I'm about to read to you the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, look at verse 19. There was a certain rich man. Now, notice, 
this is not some made up story. Jesus said there was a certain rich man. So that means this guy actually existed. It was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar. He had a name. His name was Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar did what? Died. And what happened after he died? He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosoms. The rich man also, what? Died and was buried and what? And in? So in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in what? And seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosoms. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, check this dude out. He's in hell and he still hadn't changed. He cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of my finger in water and cool my tongue for I am what? In this what? And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf that's fixed. Now let me explain to you. At this time, hell was divided up into two compartments. There was the lower part of hell, and then there was the upper region of hell. This was the place where the spirits of the dead would come. Jesus had not yet gone to hell. So Abraham and all of the seed of Abraham that were in the covenant of Abraham, when they died, their spirits went to the upper regions of hell where there was comfort. Now between the upper region and the lower region, there was a great gulf that divided hell so that those in the upper region couldn't go to the lower region. Those in the lower region couldn't go to the upper region. Now the lower region of hell, that's where all the torment was. They could see from the lower regions of hell past that gulf, they could see the area of comfort where Abraham was. This rich man was in the place where the pains were. You see, Jesus, when he died, went to the very pains of hell. All right, now watch this. This rich man said, I am tormented in this flame. And they made sure that they mentioned that there is a gulf that divided hell. But when Jesus died and when Jesus went to hell, the Bible says he preached the gospel in hell. Abraham, David, Amos, all heard the gospel preached and Jesus was the first one born out of death back into life. He went from life to death and then back from death to life. He was the firstborn of many brethren. And then after Jesus was raised from the dead, those in the upper regions of hell were moving out and Jesus closed up the great gulf and enlarged hell. So if you want to follow the devil and his angels, there would be enough room. translated the covenant people up to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? All right, now. And besides all this, verse 26, between us and you there's a great gulf so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, Father, uh, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment, a place of torment. And Abraham said unto them, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went 
unto them from the dead, they will repent. How many of y'all believe that? I thought that too, but maybe if we can get somebody who was dead to go back and tell them, then they might believe you. You know how bad it is today? Even if Jesus Christ himself came up in his pulpit, we didn't, most people wouldn't even believe, oh, that one Jesus. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they don't hear Creflo, Kenneth, and Fred now, Neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Wow. Real event took place. Notice, notice flames. Verse 24. I'm tormented in this flame. So there's a fire there. Look at Matthew 5, 22. I mean, you know, the world will tell you, oh, no, 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 no. If I go to hell, then I'm going to have friends there. There'll be no friends in hell. There will be no friends in hell. Matthew 5, 22, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thy fool shall be in danger of, of, of what? Hellfire. Look at Mark chapter 9. How many of y'all believe the word? Am I showing you these scriptures in the word? You're reading them, right? Mark chapter 9. Some of y'all feel like I'm setting you up. You don't even know what for, huh? Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worms dieth not. You're going to see some things tonight, and you're going to wonder, what are those? Worms that don't die get bigger. Worms that dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt in, 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 into life than to have two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that can never be quenched and where worms don't die. You know what he says when this fire that can't be quenched? You cannot put it out. Let me give you clearly this illustration of what happens when you die. Ladies and gentlemen, my coat represents my physical body. When you die, your spirit and your soul comes out of your physical body. Your body falls to the ground because you're not in it anymore. So once you come out of your body, you now can see things you couldn't see before. You now see God and angels and heaven. They were always there, but you couldn't see them while you were in your body. But you can also see Satan and demons and hell. And you're trying to figure out what's happening because you're in a spiritual body, and you can now comprehend spiritual matter just like when you were in a physical body and you could hold physical things. So naturally, you always heard from everybody when you die, you go to heaven, but you never got born again. You never made Jesus Lord of your life. So you immediately went towards the beauty of heaven. And you thought, this is so cool. And the angels begin to surround you. And you thought you were going in, but you never made the decision. And all of a sudden, those who had a right to you, demons, come up behind you and grab you. They have a right because you never made the decision to get born again. Now watch this. All right, now demons, hold up. <laughs> all right, now watch this. Now, they have a right to me. I never made a decision in that body. I now 
want to make a decision. I can't. I lost my soul or I've lost my right to decide. So they have right to me because when I didn't make a decision, a decision was made for me. And while you can still see the wonders of heaven, it disappears slowly because demons snatch you to the place that has a right to you. Okay. Now, let's look at the location of hell. All right, prepare yourself now. Where is hell located? Well, Proverbs 15, 24 talks about hell being beneath. Proverbs 15, 24 says that hell is from beneath. So it's in the center of the earth. Proverbs 15. Verse 24, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell where? Isaiah 14 and 9 also indicates that hell is beneath. But look at Amos chapter 9, ladies and gentlemen. Amos chapter 9 said something that I want to present some evidence of tonight. Amos 9, or page 1172 in my Bible. All right. I want to read this to you. Amos chapter 9, verse 2. Verse 2 says, Though they dig into hell then shall my hand take them though they climb up to heaven hence I will bring them down now ladies and gentlemen you and I both know just like we just read that if there's ever any evidence of heaven or hell ever any evidence of somebody raised from the dead and you bring that evidence to this world they're not going to believe it I'll let you decide. But that scripture says, though they dig into hell. Let me read to you this account. In the early 1900s, and I received this in uh, 1984, I received the letter concerning this, but, you know, we didn't have the, you know, internet up like it is now and all of the kind of things that were going on. In the early 1900s, a team of researchers from the former Soviet Union drilled a hole into what some think may be a gateway to hell. Dr. Viktor Azakov, a Russian geologist, was on a mission with other scientists to drill a nine mile deep hole in remote Siberia to hear plate movements in the middle of the earth. After drilling several miles into the bedrock, something strange began to happen. Dr. Azakov states, at about 2,000 feet down, a cavern had been reached. The drill suddenly began to rotate wildly, indicating that we had reached a large empty pocket or cavern. Temperature sensors showed a dramatic increase in heat to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It is almost as if there was a fiery inferno raging into the Earth's core. We lowered a microphone designed to detect the sounds of the plate movement down the shaft. But instead of the plate movement, we heard a human voice screaming in pain. At first, we thought the sound was coming from our own equipment. But when we made adjustments, our worst suspicions were confirmed. The screams weren't those of single humans. Although one voice was prominent, we could also make out as if in the background the screams of thousands, perhaps millions of tormented souls. 
This is what they heard. Play it. What you heard just a moment ago is 39 seconds of what they actually heard on that day. Some will say, well, I don't believe that. Others will say, I've never heard anything like it. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be duped. We know it's real. That describes perfectly what the Bible talks about with weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what you heard, some will say, well, somebody made that up. They don't believe the evidence, but let's go on. The Bible talks about torment in hell. In Luke 16, verse 24, verse 10, 25, we read about the rich man who was in torment. 2 Samuel chapter 22, let's turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I first heard that recording, I've never been able to get it out of my mind. And if you focus in a little bit deeper, you hear things that you have never heard before. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 6. Verse 6 says, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of the traps of death prevented me. Now, there's nothing fun about hell. There's torment, there's sorrows. Look at Psalms 116. I think some people have in their mind, well, if I go to hell, I can handle it. No, you can't. It wasn't even created for you. You think, well, I can bear it. You've never even been out of your body. You, you, you're tripping out over that. Psalms 116, verse 3, says, The sorrows of death compass me, and the pains of hell get hold of me, and I found trouble and sorrow. That's all you're going to find in hell. It's also recorded that there's a gate of hell. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Now remember, hell was created as a prison for the devil and his angels and those who reject God. Matthew 16 verse 18. Jesus is speaking, he says, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm about to show you some things, and you're going to see gates. You're going to see pains. You're going to see the chains. Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Matthew 23, verse 33. Verse 33 says, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? There is no escape. Once you are there, there is no way out. I was blessed to read the lost books of uh, Enoch as it gave more detail about hell. But here's a drama presentation that is very close to what the Bible describes concerning the torments in hell. Roll it.
Check her pulse. Nothing. Charging at 200. Clear. Go, go. Go again. Charging at 300. Clear. We got her. She's back. You're not going to die. Yes, I am. Let me die. We're not going to let that happen. Watch that monitor.
Now, I'm sure when you look at something like that, you say, now come on, because what we've not preached about in, the, in church are the tormentors of hell. Now remember, hell was created for the devil and his angels. Angels can take on different forms. You can recall many times in the Bible where they took on the forms of men. The Bible even says in Hebrews, be careful when you entertain strangers because you could be entertaining angels and doing it unawares. So there are creatures in hell that you've never seen before. Seraphims and cherubims, those are heavenly creatures you've never seen before. So when you begin to look at things like this, don't be so quick to say, well, nothing like that can exist. I'm about to show you something that's so very interesting in the book of Genesis chapter 6. Now somebody says, oh, but this is a bunch of fear. You better get scared now <laughs> because this is reality. This is reality. It's, it's just, there's no need of getting afraid and running out. If you die without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to have a front row seat to this. Genesis chapter 6. Let's talk about the tormentors. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God, those are angels. Those are the fallen angels. The daughter of men, those were women who were born out of a man and a woman relationship. Verse 4, there were, verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, that's intercourse, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men which were of old and men of renown. Listen to me very carefully. Here's what happened. When these fallen angels, and there were 10 of them, and we have the very names of those angels, like you know Gabriel and you know Michael. Well, there were the names of these very angels uh, that were given in the lost book of Enoch. When these angels had sex with these women, they gave birth to giants. Now, these giants attack men. They begin to drink blood. They begin to just wreak havoc and chaos and sin all over the place. That was one of the reasons for the flood. The next thing you see here is God talking to Noah. One of the reasons for the flood was to completely wipe out the seed. These angels were never, ever supposed to have intercourse with these women. That was a complete violation of heaven. And they took an oath together that they would all agree to commit this sin. They'd already rebelled against God. So now they were going against this. And God had to issue a punishment to them that was so great. They were supposed to be heavenly and they were bound to the earth. And so after the flood, there was an order issued, a judgment, that the spirits of the giants would now be called evil spirits. They would be released upon the earth to torment and to cause trouble to mankind. So the evil spirits that are on the earth right now that every now and then possess a person or they oppress their mind and all that kind, those are the disembodied spirits of those giants that came from the union of uh, angels and those women. Now a greater judgment came upon these fallen angels who committed this. They were of course condemned to hell Satan and these angels and all of the third of the angels that fell. The third of those angels that were located in incarceration in hell are the tormentors. And they are tormenting you over and over and over and over and over again. And the disembodied spirits of those giants torment you because you possess a body and they lost theirs. That's why they want to possess you. So what you'll see in hell are the tormentors. You're not supposed to be there. 
It was created for the devil and his angels. And you, you, you now will encounter those perverted angels and creations as they torment you. They will torment you forever, ever working for Christ. They will torment you for the opportunities that you had to get saved and you didn't do it. They will torment you ceaseless without stopping and all they do is torment and the pain never goes away and you will want to die but there can be no death. You're right there in the midst of that. Hell is just what it is. Hell. Now Brother Hagen gave another description which is similar to what you saw of his experience when he died and God showed him what was going on in hell. Roll this. The story of Kenneth Hagen's near-death experience is spectacular. In April of 1933, Hagen was bedridden. He had been ill with a deformed heart from birth. On the evening of the 22nd, he took a turn for the worse. His family stayed by his side and waited for the arrival of the doctor. Suddenly a pain shot through his heart like lightning. He was convinced he was living his last few moments. He states, my toes seemed to go numb. This numbness spread to my feet, my ankles, my knees, my hips, my stomach, my heart, and I leaped out of my body. I knew I was outside of my body. I could see my family in the room, but I couldn't contact them. As he tried to communicate with his family members, he felt himself leaving the room and falling into what seemed to be a downward well or cavern. Hagen claims that as he descended, he could see the lights of Earth fading away and was eventually covered by darkness. When he came to the bottom of the cavern, he was surrounded by giant orange flames. He saw what he believed to have been the gates of hell. He says he was physically drawn to those gates like a magnet, though he tried to stop himself. I was conscious of the fact that some kind of creature met me at the bottom of that pit. I didn't look at it. My gaze was riveted on the gate. As the creature grabbed Hagen, a thunderous voice spoke. The creature immediately released Hagen, and he felt himself pulled towards the light. Granny. Oh, son. You're back. Uh, Granny, I'm going again. No, no, no. Hang on. Hang on. Where's Mom? We I, I want to tell her goodbye. When I thought Mommy, you had gone, she ran out the door. I've got to tell Mommy yes. goodbye. Yes, Lily. Granny, don't, don't, don't leave me. No, 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 I won't. I'll stay right here, son. I'll be right with you. Granny, I'm, I'm going again. I, I love you. Hagen states this event occurred three times. The third time, he thought he may have been hallucinating the entire experience. But as the darkness surrounded him, he was convinced that this hellish place was real. Hagen tells of calling out into the darkness. God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. Once again, he was at the bottom of the pit, faced with the gates and the unknown creature. But again, just like the two times before, he heard the voice. I don't know what he said, but whatever he said, that place shook. It just trembled. Hagen remembers praying as he ascended towards Earth. Oh God, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to know it was like a two-ton weight lifted off my chest. Dr. Kenneth Hagen eventually recovered from his heart condition. He is known internationally as the founder and president of Rama Bible School. Let us all rise for the processional. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. 
that where I am, there ye be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. different than I expected. You, you see, I always thought dying would bring me into a world that's foggy and hazy. But this place is crystal clear. It's even more real than my life on Earth. I can think. I can talk. I can even feel. Right after the wreck, I could feel my spirit leaving my body. It was the weirdest thing, Zach. I thought I heard you screaming out to me, man. I must have been just imagining things. They asked me for my name and began to look in this thing they called the Book of Life. I guess they couldn't find it, though, because this huge angel standing next to me grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me away. I was terrified. I had no idea what was going on. I asked the angel where he was taking me, but he didn't answer. So I asked him again. Finally, he told me that only those whose names were written in the book of life could enter into heaven. And the rest would be condemned to hell forever. And I was scared. Angel threw me into some kind of holding cell where I've been sitting and thinking for a long, long time. Do you want to know what I've been thinking about? I've been thinking about you. Zach, you're a Christian. You told me so yourself. I mean, we talked about it three different times today. Kelly brought it up, and you laughed it off. Coach Adams brought it up, and you changed the subject. I mean, it came up right before the wreck. Well, the question I can't get out of my mind is this, Zach. Why haven't you ever told me about how to become a Christian? I mean, you say you're my friend, but if you really were, you would have told me about this Jesus and told me how to escape this terrible place that I'm headed for. I can feel my heart pounding in my chest. The angels who have been chosen to cast me into hell are coming down the hallway. I can hear their footsteps. I've heard of this hell, Zach. They call it the lake of fire. I can't stand it, Zach. I'm terrified. Oh, no, the angels are at the door. Oh, no. No! They're coming in, and they're pointing at me. They're grabbing me and carrying me out of the room. I can already smell the burning sulfur and brimstone. I can see the edge of the cliff where hell burns. This is it. I am without hope. We're coming closer. Closer, closer! My heart is bursting with fear. They're holding me over the flame. I'm damned forever. This is it. They have thrown me in. Fire! Pain! Hell! Why is that? Why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? Jesus. Signed. Your friend, Josh.
Tonight, a little extreme, yes, using everything we possibly could, yes. Why? Because in all that you have heard and seen tonight, the only thing I can think about is how much Jesus loves me. He died so that I don't have to experience any of this. How many more games are we going to play? How many more times are we going to do something to hinder what God wants to do in our lives? Because we don't really believe that Something's going to happen when we find ourselves in this box. And over and over again, we continue to preach this gospel so that men and women around the world can understand how much Jesus loves you. None of what you saw, you don't ever have to go through it. Provided that you make him your Lord and personal Savior. But I promise you, as I stand here tonight, the torment will be greater because you knew. You understood, you heard, you saw. You had pastors that went to the greatest extent to give you all the proof necessary so you could make a decision and to walk out of here tonight and to just roll it off your shoulders as if it was some type of scare tactic. You know what? Regardless of how you get saved, get saved. Instead of having a body in this casket, I would prefer you take a piece of paper and put my sins and drop it in this casket and let us bury it. Because I, can, I believe you can live right. Look at the things we do. We don't pray anymore. We don't come to church. We're getting high. We're having sex with members of the body. No fear of God. Act like there's not a God and like it's okay. Because we forgot about the consequences of rejecting Jesus. Now there's no sin you've committed that the blood won't clean. But he's already done everything that needs to be done for you to walk into heaven. Taff and I are going to do all that we can do that we may win some. The Bible says the way to hell is wide and many there be that go that path. That the way to heaven is narrow and there'll be but a few. You just make sure you're a part of that few. Every head bowed. Every eye closed, no walking, please, ma'am, please, sir. If you're here tonight, I want to give you the opportunity that those who are in hell wish they had and some of them did have. If you were to die right now today, if you were in this box and we were at your funeral tonight, where would you spend eternity?
in heaven or in hell. And the word says, marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. Secondly, do you need to rededicate your life to Jesus? Are you a part of the church but have yet to become a part of the body of Christ? What are you prepared to do tonight? What say ye? This is real. And the world's tried to deceive it. The world's tried to fool us. The world's tried to talk us out of our salvation. And tonight, you can set it all straight. And the joy of the Lord will come into your heart and leave this place full of joy because there is nothing in your life that can't be fixed now. If you're here tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed and you have never been born again and you say, Pastor Dollar, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. Now is not the time to be prideful or embarrassed or any of those things. Dear God, did you just read what the Bible said? Did you just see and experience? Did you just hear? Secondly, if you're here and you've been born again, but you've not been, you've not been in the word of God. And you want to rededicate yourself to the Lord. Come. Come to Jesus. This may be your last time. I don't know. Repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So I know you won't cast me out. But you take me in. And I thank you for it. You said in your word, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I am calling on your name. So I know you have saved me now. You also said, If thou shalt confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I believe in my heart, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification and I confess him now as my Lord because your word says with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and I do believe with my heart I have now become the righteousness of God in Christ and I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for accepting me and being my Savior this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the family of God. Now, those of you who are praying a prayer of rededication, repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I recommit myself to your word. I recommit myself to serve you, to live according to the word, to walk in the love of God, no matter what. In Jesus' name, your word is the final authority 
in my life. And I am committed to living life according to the Word of God. I commit myself to you and to the love of God now, henceforth, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, remember what I said. You're in Jesus. If you should sin, confess your sin, and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, what is it that you have to do to stay out of hell? Make Jesus Lord of your life. How many of you have made Jesus Lord of your life? All right, now, so people don't go to hell because of sin. People go to hell because they reject Jesus. You have not rejected him. Hell has no right or authority over your life. If you were to die right now, you would go straight to heaven. I love you so much and I pray that God's riches and best will continue to be yours as you seek him first.